The question is, where do we go from here? Where would neuroscience advance from here to understanding the kind of things that I think personally are unique to human beings? So let's have a thought experiment. Suppose in 100 years' time, we have a complete readout of the total neural activity of someone who's been in love for three months. And we also have a complete description of the connectome, a project that's going on in the EU at the moment, two billion quid, uh, you know, how the brain is wired up, etc., etc. What would be the result of that? Well, one result would be billions and billions of noughts and zeros indicating a neuron's off or a neuron's on. Do you think you would understand anything more about what it's like to be in love, what it's like to be wise or foolish and so on? And the answer is no. So clearly, it's not as if we're going to make much progress to assuming these slightly higher order things from perception onwards uh, by brain science. One final point in relation to perception. The great uh, Hubel and Wiesel, who were the great neurophysiologists of perception, won the Nobel Prize, they ended their lives, I've forgotten which one it was, saying essentially, we don't understand how edge perception and color and the sense of distance and so on all come together in the same spot for me to be able to see that is my cup over there. So we don't even have the beginning of understanding how we unify neural activity or putative neural activity into a perception of an object out there. And that's because there is no way that neuroscience can handle intentionality, which is absolutely fundamental to mind above the level of pure sensation. So Ray's touched on the binding problem, I think, there, uh, putting it all together. But I wonder whether, Susanna, you can think of examples to, uh, to offer, Ray, where we talk about why there would be some surprises, things that we have in a common sense way thought about vision or thought yes. about our senses actually get revised when we find out how things are actually working. Well, I, I wanted to address first off that uh, Hubel and Whistle did not end their <coughs> lives because Thorsten Whistle is still alive. Beg your pardon. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I, did, I did train with David Hubel. Well, there and, you go. Uh, yeah. And to the best of my knowledge, he never said, you know, I give up, uh, who knows what's happening, we can get a handle mm -hmm. on it. On the contrary, he and Thorsten Whistle developed functional architecture and they brought structure and function together. And sure, they were aware that they had not solved the visual system, but they solved quite a bit of the early stages. And I think they made a major contribution. And neuroscience is not finished, but I think that, uh, and it may be that we don't have the methods, it may be that we need to reconsider a lot of the foundational bases, but, uh, but there's been a, a large amount of uh, very significant progress that has been made. And, and I would, uh, I would uh, also, want to address the, the issue of love and understanding what's happening in the brain when somebody's in love. To be sure, we're not there, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not achievable. And if we did understand exactly what it means at a, from an, on a neural basis to be in love, I think that it would be much easier to come up with uh, very practical applications, like maybe see people want to fall in love or they want to fall out of love. And if we understand how the brain is doing that, there may be a lot of uh, people that will be interested in gaining some access to the neural processes and, that, uh, and have very real applications. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.